Okay, we're back. We're live. It's the one o'clock block. This is uh, Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Jay Fidel, and uh, our guest today, Denny Roy from uh, the East West Center. And our topic uh, with Denny Roy is can human rights, whoops, wrong, wrong case. We're going to talk about connecting the dots um, on China and U.S. policy and where is it going and um, what are the factors involved. Hi, Denny. Nice to have you on the show. Thanks. Nice to be here. So uh, let's talk about, um, you know, the status of uh, U.S.-China relations. I, I'm not telling you before we began that, uh, you know, back in the uh, early 2000s, um, you know, you could go to China and feel good. You could say, well, there's, it's not a completely perfect relationship, but um, we can live with this and it's going good places and it's, it's fun to be there and everybody's so friendly and, and the government is getting more enlightened all the time. And, and a lot of Americans did that. But somewhere along the line, it changed. What happened? I'd say the single biggest factor in the decline in U.S.-China relations is the international structure. What I mean by that is until recently, the United States was strong, China was weak, and both sides understood that this was the reality they had to work within. It set the parameters for the relationship. It was relatively stable. It was also awkward, of course, because uh, the Chinese, are, of course, are very proud of their 5,000-year history. Uh, certainly, if you were to make a list of the, the most admirable and, and, and uh, respectable civilizations in world history, China would be one of the finalists. Uh, it's easy for Chinese to think that their country is the natural leader of Asia. It has been through most of those centuries uh, and until uh, uh, this uh, recent down period, which the Chinese call the century of humiliation from 1842 to 1949, China was clearly the, the, the preeminent civilization in Asia. Uh, so China during this period recently has been forced to tolerate American preeminence in the region, which American preeminence came on the scene just during this period of, of Chinese weakness, which the Chinese see, see as a temporary and unfortunate and, and uh, an anomaly. So the, the Chinese have understood that in the post-war period and, and particularly the post-Cold War period that, that they're in a rebuilding phase. And here we get to Deng Xiaoping's advice. You know, Deng, who died in 1997, advised that uh, Chinese foreign policy uh, ought to consist of China laying low, not taking a, a leadership position in international politics, not putting itself forward and remaining calm and in the face of perceived slights and trying to get along with the United States. Was that a good policy? Would you agree with him if you were there with him now? I, I think uh, Deng's policies both inside the country and in, and in uh, China's external relations have been fantastically successful. But now we get to the structural change where China is now much stronger relative to the United States has, has, has largely closed that gap with the United States which changes the outlook of both countries. So previously it was fairly easy for China to tolerate uh, their agenda not being fully realized in the region because they understood that China was too weak to challenge the United States, at least, at least for the time being. And the United States was relatively patient with China in its project to kind of socialize China. That is, that is uh, uh, get China used to the idea of being supportive of the international system as, as uh, uh, sponsored by the United States. That is to, to, to be persuaded that China could be secure and prosperous within this US-led system. But uh, the Americans in seeing that, that uh, China was uh, stalling on this or that issue uh, could afford to, to, to think we've got lots of time before China gets powerful and therefore it's not threatening that China isn't doing everything we want right now. But now bring in this structural change and the, the, the Chinese think now that, that that period of rebuilding that Deng Xiaoping talked about is over now. So Deng is out and now we switch to Xi Jinping's foreign policy, which involves asserting regional leadership by China, which involves imposing Chinese preferences on the region, winning uh, those those uh, controversies that the, the Chinese you, usually had to, to swallow their pride to put up with uh, American preferences for. And in, in particular, we see 
the Chinese going after their their irredentism agenda, which means reclaiming territory that you think rightfully belongs to yourself. So in this large swath of, of, of the region from the South China Sea to Taiwan to the East China Sea, even the Yellow Sea the border with India, uh, we see the, the, the Chinese now more insistent on the Chinese side getting its way as opposed to the other side. China is less tolerant of uh, the US agenda. And on the US side, the Americans are no longer as, as patient with uh, waiting for the Chinese to catch up to accepting American leadership and, and uh, China living with, uh, within the American sponsored system. Americans have concluded that it's time to declare that the, the socialization project has failed. We need to move on to something else. Uh, there, there was kind of an expectation on the American side that as China became more economically developed and more wealthy, that, that its politics would become more liberal, both inside China and, and, in, and in China's foreign policy would be more mm. cooperative. Mm. Uh, it would come to accept the American agenda. The Chinese would think like the Americans that we have these common interests in supporting this uh, American sponsored international system. But what Americans have seen under Xi Jinping is that Although wealthier, China is now less liberal, both in domestic policy and in foreign policy. It could have been the other way, though, couldn't it? I mean, it could have been they they would have had a more enlightened view of things and they wouldn't need to uh, assert themselves so much. Uh, It could have been that they they saw themselves as co-partners in the liberal world order. Is that possible? Sure. International politics is all about uh, human decisions and and, uh, governments deciding usually based on their domestic politics or their view of history to tread a certain path and China could have chosen a different path, but, but uh, uh, it's not surprising that China has taken the approach it has under Xi Jinping. If, if uh, you think about the broader sweep of Chinese history and the, and the sense of grievance from the century of shame. But let me mention a couple other factors in addition to the, the change of the international structure that are, that are sort of honorable mention. Uh, the, the first is President Trump's focus on trade imbalances as being very important. This goes back to e- even long prior to him being president. This has been a consistent theme for him is, is uh, identifying cases of where he thinks a, a U.S. trade relationship is, with some other countries unfair to the United States and, and focusing on rectifying it. Uh, his feeling in this regard seems to be distinct from, separate from, the issue of China growing more powerful overall. What I mean by that is uh, even even, uh, countries that don't necessarily pose a military threat to the United States, but that have uh, a trade uh, surplus with the United States have have come in for criticism from President Trump, even allies such as Japan and South Korea. So so the the fact that China has the largest uh, bilateral trade surplus with the United States made it a target, I think, for this pre-existing inclination on the part of President Trump and, and American presidents being very strong in the making of foreign policy, this, this colors the whole approach of this administration. Mm. And, and then a second factor is, is uh, of course, domestic politics. So in the United States, uh, of course, we have the presidential election coming up and we see the Republican party in, in general and President Trump in particular, taking a very tough line on China as part of the presidential campaign and, and the election campaigns of other other Republicans who are running for, for office. But in, in China also at about the same time, there will be the, the fifth plenum, which puts some pressure on Xi Jinping also to not only answer what the United States is doing, but, but also to show that, that uh, he's, he is fulfilling expectations of being a tough foreign policy president for his potential challengers inside of China. So we've got this combination of the domestic politics in both places uh, driving the relationship further downward. Mm, it, it, it comes to me to ask, um, you know, there, there are people who say that a few months ago, China would have liked to seen Trump uh, win in this election coming November. But more recently, um, those same people are saying, no, that's not true. Um, in fact, the Chinese don't like his uh, unpredictability and they would rather see somebody more predictable that they can engage with on foreign policy issues. What, what have you heard about that? Yes, this is hard to measure objectively because uh, you, know, you can't do uh, the kinds of public uh, opinion surveys in China that we might be able to do in other places. But 
but my sense was that in 2016, uh, uh, most Chinese who thought about international affairs uh, preferred uh, Donald Trump to be president over Hillary Clinton. The expectation being that that uh, Trump might drive a hard economic bargain, but but uh, the Chinese could handle that. They they could understand that, and they could they're confident that they could make a deal, and and alleviate American pressure that way. Whereas if uh, Hillary Clinton had become president, she would have had a lot more interest in the, the geostrategic threat that China posed to the United States, which would have been a lot more difficult for China to deal with. Meanwhile, what about the uh, tariffs? Have the tariffs done anybody any good? They certainly haven't improved our relationship with China, but have they done any good indirectly? Um, have they done any good for this country? I like the idea that, that uh, President Trump challenged China in an area that uh, really got China's attention. Uh, but uh, he's got a lot of criticism for using that particular tool to try to rectify the problems in uh, US-China economic relationship. A lot of folks would argue that, that the problem isn't necessarily, or, or the, 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 uh, the most pressing problem uh, shouldn't bring a focus on the balance of trade between China and the United States. The, the, the more pressing problem would be structural impediments to fair trade between the United States and China. The, 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 the tendency of the Chinese to treat American companies systematically differently and, and more restrictively than say Ch Chinese companies would have in the United States. And, and that maybe the emphasis should have been on, on bringing about those hard structural changes on the part of China rather than simply the Chinese buying more American stuff. Is that, is that, was that, is that doable as a matter of foreign policy? We can go to, we can go to China and say, look, you're not treating us fairly. You got all these restraints. You're taking our intellectual property or you're taking advantage of us, as as Trump says once in a while. Um, I mean, would they have, could they have, could they now agree to that? Or is it built into their, what do you call it, business culture, political culture, never to agree with that? Always to try to keep the upper hand on, 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 on business treatment of American companies. I think it would have been difficult for the United States to, to get 100% of what it might be asking in, in that regard, requiring the Chinese Communist Party to really change the way it does business and change you know, fundamentally the relationship between the, the party and the economic system in China. Nevertheless, uh, pushing the Chinese in that area and, and maybe using trade as, a, as a, one of the levers of pressure you know, might have gotten us some, pro some progress in that direction. And we should recognize also that there, there were some Chinese elites who actually welcomed the idea of, of uh, the Americans using a kind of what the Japanese would call gaiatsu, you know, outside pressure, bringing about changes that would be very painful for the Chinese to make, but in the long run would make China better and more competitive. Mm, gee, that, that seems appealing. Um, you know, the other thing is from what you've said, I, I, maybe this is uh, oversimplifying it, but it seems that the Chinese have been stuck in the century of shame and they're still stuck in, they don't, they don't, they have not recognized their power. They have great power, but they're still in shame. Uh, the US after the war had great power, um, but, but possibly they overestimate their power um, as a matter of foreign policy in China, in the South China Sea and all that in Asia Pacific. Um, and, and maybe Trump doesn't fully see that the U.S. has declined in its influence in the area. Um, the, you know, the pivot was abandoned or um, um, uh, lost strength somehow. Um, and so you have one party um, believes that it is, it is ashamed and should, and should react, um, should take steps that are aggressive. And another party that feels that it's more strong than it really is uh, and is not taking the steps to engage. Uh, I know it sounds oversimplified, but is, it, is there anything in there as far as you're concerned? Yeah, I think uh, Americans err uh, in as much as we overemphasize our influence in Asia, that, that our, our policy should be based on, on uh, winning over third parties in the region. Uh, soft power. Well, uh, it, uh, soft power means something very specific to me. Um, I, I think that that's part of it. But but it's also uh, something I wouldn't describe as soft power, but making a strategic argument that, that it is in the interest of, of these third party countries in Asia to support with the United States, the, this current liberal uh, international order, that they are better off 
uh, backing up the United States and sponsoring that that model than, than they would be in in uh, becoming subject to whatever the, the Chinese would replace that order with. Yeah. So if you're isolationist and you don't seek support of other third parties, then you you lose influence. And and I, I would like your thoughts about uh, our state of influence now, if you would, um, not only with China but with with uh, all of Asia Pacific and Indo Pacific. Are we are we losing influence? Have we lost influence? Why? Well, let, let's look at the indications first. Uh, China is almost everyone's number one trade partner. So this gives the Chinese leverage because the, the, the Chinese can link the trade relationship with uh, their political agenda and they're not at all shy about doing that. Uh, if you talk to folks from Southeast Asia, particularly elites, you know, whether politicians in private or journalists or scholars, and Southeast Asia I think is you know, one of the key battlegrounds where uh, both the uh, United States and China are competing for influence. You talk to these folks, uh, generally they will say China is more influential now than the United States. Uh, China is visible, the, the money is there, Chinese officials come to the region. Uh, if uh, you, you look at uh, China's success in gaining influential positions in international organizations such as the United Nations, you see a steady uh, improvement, a steady increase in, in uh, uh, China's leverage over uh, those kind of levers. Uh, in fact, uh, just recently, the Chinese got one of their officials on, on the Law of the Sea Court, you know, which, which in my mind is a travesty given the way that Chinese reacted to the 2016 South China Sea decision. Uh, and, and if you want a sort of a, a, a microcosm of this effect, you can look at the Philippines under President Duterte. Now here's a, here's a US treaty government uh, whose, whose president has been at best very ambivalent uh, about whether uh, he wants to cooperate with the United States to protect Philippine interests against China or accommodate China and cut out the United States altogether. So maybe we could talk about the, some of the causes of, of this, uh, what is widely seen as a decline of US influence in the region. Yes, please. And, and I would say that the, the main one is simply the, the rise of China, particularly the China's economic development, which, which again makes China so economically important to almost every country in the region. And this is not a, a failure on the part of the United States. It's simply uh, China having a very fast economic growth rate, you know, so triple that of the United States, if not more, over the last couple of decades, so that China's got itself in this position of having leverage with other countries. But having said that, there are some failings on the, on the part of the United States. I would say the United States deciding to back out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership you know, what, what was a big one and, and symbolic. Uh, regardless of how the, the, the TPP itself would have changed the trade relationships between the participants, uh, it, it was the, the optics of the United States abdicating the position of being a leader in, in the, the, the pushing of international trade uh, toward, toward uh, uh, a lessening of barriers to, you know, toward new frontiers that, that would make it more attractive for more countries to participate. The United States is kind of notorious for not sending uh, high-ranking U.S. officials to important meetings in, in uh, Asia, particularly Southeast Asia, or sending lower-ranking delegations than everyone else is sending. Uh, it's notorious for, for being somewhat deaf to the concern of other countries in the region. That is, say, U.S. officials come to a country in Asia and, and uh, emphasize that we Americans are very concerned with this particular issue and we want to know what your country is doing to satisfy us on this issue, as opposed to asking what, what, what is of greatest concern to you and how, how can we together work to, to accomplish this goal. This is not meant as a partisan criticism, but if your, your, your bumper sticker approach to foreign policy is America first, uh, this is just, just factually, it's going to have an alienating effect to some degree on other potential partners in the region. Tellingly, the Chinese foreign, uh, foreign minister, Wang Yi, was in Europe a few days ago. And uh, among the many things he said in, in between threatening other countries with economic punishment if they didn't follow the Chinese agenda, he also said, 
uh, we will never say China first. <laughs> Obviously playing directly on this idea that, that of course, I, every country looks out for number one, but there are differences in how you can approach this problem. Uh, and, and, and a different way to approach it would be to, to argue that, that uh, we see our two countries as partners and there's, there are things that we can work with, with you on together that are of equal benefit to both of us. Well, it's, it's, it seems like they, you know, they have a, uh, an initiative going and trying to look good, trying to look good in the United Nations, trying to look good in there, even when they, they really don't deserve to look good, they, they're trying to look good. And in the process, we don't look so good. Um, and so uh, I, I think this is going to continue at least for a while, don't you? Well, the, the Chinese are trying very hard to look good as, as we are. They have uh, their counterpart organizations and efforts to, to what we do. Uh, what one uh, sort of advantage the United States has here is that the, the Chinese tend to often do things that undercut their efforts to make themselves look better, but we cannot, cannot count on them always doing that for us. Hmm. Well, that takes us to uh, some of the, uh, uh, you know, high, high profile aggressive moves uh, that China has done. Um, and I, I guess I think first of uh, Hong Kong, but I also think of uh, uh, Xinjiang and the, and the Uyghurs, and some of the other moves they've made, uh, including the way they've handled, um, you know, people who visit the country, um, many things they have done that are um, not really uh, reflective of a, a respect for human rights. And so um, why, why do they do these things? It just strikes me that, is this, is this part of uh, Xi Jinping's um, larger vision or is this, um, just a, a way to uh, a way for him to feel good, um, because it, it, to the world it doesn't look so good. Well, I, I'll go back first to uh, something I referred to earlier: Deng Xiaoping's advice that that uh, China should see itself in a rebuilding period and and uh, should should go out of its way not to antagonize uh, foreign countries, particularly important countries like the United States, keep a low profile, and so on. Deng's advice implicitly uh, w w was always to be temporary. That, that is, uh, the implication was there will come a point where China is past the rebuilding period and is strong enough that then it can begin to more forcefully impose its, its will and its agenda on the international community. Deng was simply saying, wait until China is strong enough to do this. Well, it appears that, that uh, under Xi Jinping, Beijing has made the decision that, that the time has come that China can begin to act uh, more forcefully in, in uh, imposing its agenda on the rest of the region. Why now? Well, I, I think three things. First of all, China is relatively strong. It is, it is it, it, as I mentioned, it, it, it had been continually cutting the gap between itself and the United States over the last couple of decades, and now reaches a point where it's certainly not as strong as the United States, either economically or militarily, but, but it's getting close to, to the level of a sort of a peer competitor, as U.S. government would say. Secondly, the, the Chinese perceive the United States as waning, as declining, particularly after the, the 2008 financial crisis. Mm. Uh, you know, the, the, the Chinese are very eager to see, uh, you know, e even from, from a, a, a communist ideology, that, that uh, the strongest capitalist power reach, reach a point where, where it uh, sort of cripples itself and, and uh, makes way for the strongest socialist power. So, so the Chinese are are constantly watching for signs of American weakness. And that was, in the Chinese mind, that was a big one. And third, the, the Chinese seem to think that they have enough economic penetration in, in Asia with, with uh, most of the countries in Asia that that gives the Chinese enough leverage that they, they, they have the luxury of now worrying less about other countries' fear in China, which, which I think was a big check on Chinese foreign policy until recently. So China worrying less about being loved, but uh, and more about being respected, and using that economic leverage to ensure that other countries don't have a choice but to conform to, to Chinese preferences. So, so to, just to, to continue, you, you mentioned uh, that there are several uh, instances where China seems to be act, acting aggressively, and and often you you can you can point to a list of perhaps you know, five or six things. You mentioned some of them that that in the year 2020 alone. Uh, you, where, where you see uh, China seemingly having decided uh, that, that uh, we're going we're to push harder on, on every front. 
as if Xi Jinping is given the order full speed ahead on all fronts. I think the, the reality, however, is a little more complicated than that. Uh, if if you, you look at this list of items you might have, uh, you, you would, I think, find that uh, each of them has its own drivers and its own schedule. It, it, so that the, the totality is not necessarily reflective of a decision by the Chinese to, to uh, stop worrying about, about uh, China's uh, prestige in the world and, and simply rush to, to uh, winning in, uh, on the battleground in, in all these uh, areas of strategic competition with, with other countries. So if you take them one by one, uh, Hong Kong, for example, uh, some years ago, you know, uh, the, there was an instance of people power in Hong Kong where, where huge numbers of people came out on the street and protested a, a proposed law that was uh, the uh, anti-sedition law. And then last year, the same thing happened with regard to the proposed uh, national security law. So Hong Kong for many years has presented the Chinese leadership with this problem of, of number one, they think of China, uh, Hong Kong as having been brainwashed and, and, and needing to have their brains reoriented because Hong Kong has been you know, outside of the grasp of the Communist Party for so long. And secondly, this problem of people power, which in both of these instances you know, seem to suggest that, that uh, the Hong Kong government uh, was, was limited in what it could do by, by this outpouring of, of a public sentiment and, and public mobilization, you know, which was horrifying to the Chinese Communist Party. You know, when they saw something like that with, with the Falun Gong, they took harsh action to make sure that would never happen again. So, so for several years, uh, Beijing has felt that it needed to take uh, the, the kind of action that it ends up taking in, in 2020. It, it's not something that's just happened this year. In the East China Sea, you know, where, where uh, China has uh, territorial conflict, uh, 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 conflicting claims with Japan, this really goes back to the year 2010 when uh, the Japanese government took uh, government ownership over the Senkaku Islands, which previously had been officially owned by a, a Japanese private citizen. Uh, so from that time forward, the, the Chinese consider that a Japanese attempt to solidify their control of the, the islands, you know, making uh, Chinese claims uh, farther and farther from realization. So since that time, they've been, they've been sort of periodically, steadily you know, pulsing, the uh, flooding the uh, Senkaku Island region with uh, Chinese ships and aircraft. So what's happening there is a continuation of something from many years ago. The South China Sea, I, I think that the, uh, the, the key event in recent Chinese policy is the decision by Xi Jinping to build those art artificial islands, so-called islands, and put military bases on them. That, that was a decision to take a more uh, assertive uh, Chinese posture and based on, I think, the, the Chinese sense that China could put more ships in the area than any of the other claimants. And it was time to, to uh, condition the rest of the world to think of the South China Sea as, a, as Chinese uh, territorial waters. The, uh, the border clashes with Iran, is no, uh, sorry, with India is another item on the list. Uh, this again is uh, several years in making, you know, the recent clash that we had in, in the Gawan River Valley uh, this year. Uh, the, the, the Chinese for many years have been building infrastructure to support China's ability to de defend uh, disputed parts of the border that the Chinese claim. And in, in more recently, the Chinese have seen the Indians doing the same thing. So, so the rise in recent tensions, which resulted in that incident earlier this year, was a culmination of, uh, of uh, these two several year long trends bumping into each other. Uh, a final thing we might have on the list is, is uh, what's been happening with Taiwan. We've seen a steady increase in Chinese military pressure and, and you know, hostile signals, aggressive signals to, to, to Taiwan that, that uh, we see you going down the path of, of independence. And, and um, we want to warn you that, that uh, as you continue to take steps down this path, we, we are more prepared to launch a military effort to, to uh, reincorporate Taiwan into the People's Republic of China, uh, and into China, under the People's Republic of China, which had never been, of course. This goes back to President Tsai Ing-wen, who the Chinese consider a, a, a separatist, a, a pro-independence uh, politician. Mm -hmm. Her election in 2016, and then with her re-election in 2020, 
it was incumbent upon Xi Jinping to take you know, further and maybe maybe uh, stronger uh, gestures and signals toward Taiwan to match what what uh, Chinese elites saw as the, the, the losing of ground with President Tsai now and when having won two consecutive presidential elections in Taiwan. Well, uh, we, we only have a little, little time left and I, I did want to get to the question of COVID. Uh, how has COVID affected all of this? Um, the Chinese, uh, even now, are there, uh, what I read this morning is that they are physically forcing people to take medicine. I don't know if that's a vaccine medicine or a, a, a therapeutic, but um, they're pretty tough on that. And I think they, they, they see that they've lost some face over it. Uh, Trump has uh, insulted them many times and has claimed that they're responsible for the pandemic. Uh, how does that affect the relationship between the two countries? How does that affect China, China's image of the world? Yeah, I think there are two major effects. So the, the first is China's international reputation. Uh, so, uh, uh, of course, one could argue that, that uh, uh, some aspects of the way that uh, China undertook to control the outbreak were effective and maybe admirable, but generally speaking, uh, uh, countries like ours uh, uh, are, are uh, disturbed by you know, some of the measures that, that a, 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 a authoritarian government might take in a situation like that. Uh, I mean, you have to quickly add that the United States has not done a very good job, but generally speaking, the the, uh, the, the Chinese approach to both the pandemic and their messaging as, as, uh, as a result of the pandemic has lost China prestige in a lot of important areas of the world, not necessarily the entire world, but, but uh, certainly the United States, Europe, and uh, some of the important countries in Asia. The, the second major aspect of the fallout for China is an acceleration of decoupling, that is, uh, uh, making China and other countries less economic, economically dependent on each other. Uh, th this was not a new issue. Uh, th th there was a lot of talk uh, prior to the pandemic uh, in countries, including the United States, uh, about the vulnerability that we put ourselves in by being too heavily reliant on China for the supply of uh, vital supplies. Mm. During the pandemic, we saw that, that uh, uh, amongst being a world leader in the supply of lots of other things, and including our, our country, China had, had, uh, the, the, was the main manufacturer worldwide of things like medicines and masks. So, so that uh, when there is a, a crunch where we, we desperately need some important supply, uh, we left ourselves vulnerable by being so heavily uh, dependent on China. And then you add to that some of the signals out of China, particularly by the Chinese media, that, that uh, perhaps China should take advantage of, of uh, its control over some of these supplies to, to, to try to uh, coax uh, uh, more compliant uh, political behavior uh, out, of, out of certain other countries. So the, so the Chinese sort of reinforced our fears about being overly reliant on China. So as a result, uh, there, there's an accelerated movement to, to reduce the dependence of many countries on Chinese supplies, it, certainly in, in uh, areas of vital supplies, certainly uh, medical related supplies, but going even beyond this, it, it's, it's uh, given more impetus to the idea that, that uh, there are sensitive sectors that go beyond the medical where countries need to produce more for themselves or diversify their supplies away from China to, to other countries that perhaps they trust more. Uh, Danny, one last question before we're done is, uh, is about uh, the election coming soon. Um, and, um, you know, there certainly uh, uh, Trump has been attacking China in various ways. Uh, Biden has not been all that kind to China in his public statements. Um, and I wonder uh, what, chi what you think China would want in terms of a result of that election. And I also wonder, it's a little compound, but I also wonder what you think the, the proper policy of the winner of that election should adopt in order to improve our position, our influence, our relationship with China. Yeah, I think uh, uh, if uh, uh, you asked the Chinese uh, which of the two they would support, uh, it, I, I think there's, there, there isn't as clear an answer as, as there would have been in, in uh, the previous election. Uh, with with uh, Donald Trump, uh, what the Chinese get 
that they, that they uh, would approve of is, is um, Trump himself seems to be, although very interested in trade, not so interested in geo strategy. I think a lot of his advisors are. Uh, Trump himself not so interested in geo strategy and not so interested in human rights. So l less likely to beat up on China over human rights than, than uh, uh, perhaps a lot of other people in that position might be. And because China, Trump is so interested in trade, he is he is liable to, in some cases, trade off geo strategy uh, in order to get a, a favorable trade agreement with China. Um, the, with uh, Candidate Biden, on the other hand, uh, you see a lot of interest expressed in repairing U.S. alliances. Uh, now, from the Chinese point of view, I, I think it's a, it's a big plus that, that uh, President Trump has, has uh, in some cases, damaged U.S. relationships with U.S. allies. That's great for China in, in making the United States uh, uh, a less effective international leader, a less appealing international leader, mm. and, and in creating doubts among U.S. allies in Asia as to U.S. reliability and, and uh, whether the United States is willing to support them for the long haul. So Biden would likely, based on what he's emphasizing, put more emphasis on repairing those relationships, uh, probably less emphasis on making the uh, alliances uh, financially solvent for the United States the way President Trump has. Biden is more likely to take the more traditional American approach that, that uh, the United States sees value in these alliances and therefore is, is uh, uh, willing to, to, to pay a certain financial cost because of the, the more intangible benefit we think we get from that. Biden is also more interested in human rights issues. One of the senior campaign officials recently referred to the Uyghur genocide in China, very strong language. Uh, so, so on the one hand, the Chinese would, would uh, with Trump, they would get uh, less predictability and, and uh, maybe less emphasis on geo strategy and, and uh, ideology. With Biden, perhaps less emphasis on a, on a trade war but maybe a stronger commitment to U.S. alliances, therefore bolstering U.S. leadership in the region. Uh, so, so it, it doesn't look great for, for uh, from the Chinese point of view, uh, f uh, to think about what the, the package that either candidate would offer them. The Chinese government, nevertheless, seems to have taken a pretty strong position uh, opposing President Trump. But I, but I think Chinese elites generally would have a more mixed view. Well, um, which which one of them do you think would um, come up with a policy that would best serve American interests right now? I, I think the repair of U.S. alliances, the recommitment to U.S. alliances, is a really pressing need. Uh, so, so to get to your question of of what I would recommend for U.S. foreign policy, uh, I'm happy to see that candidate Biden is emphasizing that need. Uh, that would be at the top of my list. Uh, secondly, lots of analysts talk about this, and I agree that the United States would, would serve its foreign policy best by rebuilding at home. That is, uh, doing the things we need to make ourselves a fundamentally strong country, uh, areas that we have under our own control, you know, domestically. And that if we are our best selves at home, that, that makes us a stronger country internationally, and, and foreign policy issues will largely take care of themselves. Uh, third, I think uh, an American policy of uh, limiting to some extent our cooperation with China in certain targeted sectors, in certain second, uh, uh, sensitive areas, is very advisable. Uh, candidate Trump has, has talked about uh, dramatically decoupling the United States from China. Uh, I, I think probably something in the middle where uh, we don't uh, over enthusiastically throw out all cooperation with China, uh, including on issues where we have a, co a common interest, where, where cooperation with China is actually good for us. But we do need to be strong and smart uh, about um, targeted uh, decoupling, it might be called. And finally, I think the United States government could do a better job and needs to do a better job in defining a kind of a China that the United States could live with, a Chinese foreign policy that the United States can live with, uh, going beyond simply what the Trump administration has emphasized in, in rallying the other countries in the region against China. 
Well, thank you, Denny. Denny Roy, East West Center. It's wonderful to talk to you and have your view on all these things. It's an education. Uh, we really appreciate you coming, you coming down to Think Tech. We hope we can talk to you again soon. Thank you. Nice talking with you. Aloha.